Good afternoon. I want to welcome you all here today in these last hours of an incredible Netroots convention and especially to welcome our incredible panel. Thank you for being here. I am Michelle Regalado Dietrich. I'm the chair and founder of the Democratic National Committee's Council on the Environment and Climate Crisis. We meet here today at a critical moment, and you know that without my saying it. We have just experienced the hottest days on record, quite likely in 125,000 years. We have historic flooding, including right here in Chicago, stronger hurricanes, terrible air quality from climate-fueled wildfires, and oppressive heat, and that's coming back again this week. The climate crisis is not coming, it is here now, and it is getting worse, and it will keep getting worse until we stop burning the fossil fuels and move to wind and solar and geothermal. We know what to do. So that's the hope. The other part of the hope is all of you in this room and our wonderful panelists. Never before has the moment to act on the climate crisis been more urgent. And ACT is what the DNC Climate Council has done since we started four years ago. We helped shape the most environmentally friendly Democratic Party platform in 2020, helped elect President Biden and Vice President Harris. Uh, we helped to take back the Senate in 2020 and helped to blunt the expected and luckily failed Republican wave in 2022, all while building out the largest network of state-based environmental councils in the nation and holding hundreds of events to organize environmental voters. But we can't rest, and I know everyone in this room is working very hard. Thank you. Because we have climate deniers in charge of committees in the House. We have Republican governors and Republican attorneys generals suing just about every time the Biden-Harris administration works to protect our environment. And of course, we have a whole field of Republican candidates running for president, Senate, the House, governorships, to undo all the progress we've made in the last two years, from rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement to rescinding the previous president's rollbacks of landmark environmental protections to the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, the largest ever investment in fighting the climate crisis. What's more, we have a concerted attack by uh, effort by Republicans to run for school boards and city councils and county commissions, Republicans who are determined to disrupt, delay, and deny progress for people and planet at the local level as well. I'm going to ask for tech support because uh, moving to the next slide worked earlier. And there we go. I got it. All right. Um, so we know there was strong support by voters for key provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act. And April polling by our friends at Data for Progress, I think uh, Daniel DeSaroth, who's been so helpful to us on many occasions, is here in the room. Uh, it showed the key climate provisions of the IRA are widely popular, continue to be popular. Voters do not want them overturned in Congress. What's more, nearly half of voters thought the U.S. needs to do more on climate change. And even after being told about the provisions of IRA, 42% still felt that way. I'm just about guessing after the uh, weather events of the last couple of weeks, that percentage has gone up. By the way, if you want to get this slide and more follow-up information on polling and messaging, please sign up on one of the clipboards making its way around the room. We also plan time at the end for questions for speakers. There are index cards. Please write your question on the index card. And then uh, Russ here and Lake, uh, who are uh, advisors to the Climate Council, will be collecting We'll have that bag there. Just go and put your index card in the bag. If we don't get to your question at the end, we'll be answering on social media. Um, so um, I also want to say something. All those cards and flyers, they're in the front part of the room. And the former teacher in me is saying, please, please move up. We'd love to have a warm, friendly conversation here. And it's really great up here. You might, oh, I, I actually see, it's cooler too. Thank you. <laughs> so we have to win in 2024. And to do that, in my view, we need Democrats to run and win on climate and on environmental justice. Um, and that is what we are here today to discuss. And I could not think of a better group of panelists to do so. First off, we have the Lieutenant Governor of the best state in the nation, which just happens to be my home state. 
<laughs> no insult to other states, which are also great. Uh, Garland Gilchrist. Garland is no stranger to the progressive movement and to Netroots. As part of the Whitmer Gilchrist administration, he has focused on building a more just, equitable, prosperous, and connected Michigan. He's a problem solver an advocate for a Michigan where everyone thrives, and a leader who brings people together to get that done. From co-chairing the Michigan Joint Task Force on Jail and Pretrial Incarceration, to helming the state's COVID-19 Task Force on Racial Disparities, to leading efforts to connect over 23,000 unserved Michiganders uh, to, and connect them to affordable high-speed internet, which is a former county commissioner of a rural district I am personally grateful for. Garland, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you. Our second panelist is hometown hero, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky from right here in the great state of Illinois. In fact, we are just a few miles from her district. She's also someone who really needs no introduction here to the Netroots crowd because she is a lifelong champion for working class and middle class families. She began her advocacy, and I love this, she began her advocacy as a young homemaker, leading a successful campaign to require expiration dates on food, including formula and baby food. Uh, once, it's hard to believe that was opposed, but it was, and she fought and she won. She continues to organize around all the issues that we hold dear. And in addition to being a committed member of the Progressive Caucus, she is a member of the House Democratic Leadership as a deputy whip, chief deputy whip, and has spent her career promoting protecting our environment, fighting for health care access, women's rights, and comprehensive immigration reform. Congresswoman, thank you so much for being here today. It is a true honor. And our final... And our final panelist is the executive director of Greenpeace USA, Ebony Twilly Martin. Ebony is a hero of mine and also a friend. She is a passionate and fearless advocate for our planet and environmental justice. And she reminds us so rightly to that to win the fight for this planet, our only planet, the climate movement must be powered by racial justice. She is leading Greenpeace in the fight to dismantle systems of oppression and to engage more black and brown communities in this crucial work. Greenpeace is and has been at the forefront of some of the most important, innovative, and impactful organizing around environmental justice and the climate crisis. And we are so fortunate to have Ebony and her expertise with us here today. So I've been looking forward to this discussion for months. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive in. Um, and I'm going to address most of the questions to a particular panelist, but I really invite all of you to then to jump in and let's have a conversation. Um, so first, Congresswoman Schakowsky, um, the role that climate change and environmental justice issues um, played in the midterm is the topic here. There were armchair pundits. There are armchair pundits every election cycle, right? Uh, this time, they were saying last summer, the climate and environmental justice were not going to be important issues for voters in the midterms. And I wonder, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's true? Did the passage of the IRA or other things affect it? Well, the, the, the pundits were absolutely wrong about climate, just like they were actually um, about reproductive rights. They said, oh, you know, by the time the election comes, voters won't be, be paying attention to things like that. So that was just absolutely wrong. Um, and we um, now are able to begin to really um, take credit on the idea that the largest investment ever in climate was a result of the Inflation Reduction Act and other bills that, that we were able to pass in the Congress that the President of the United States wholeheartedly supported, um, you know, half uh, a third of a trillion dollars going for, uh, for, for climate alone in that, in that legislation. And the results are still uh, rolling out. And that's the beauty of this, that this is ongoing and that people are going to be able to see in their own communities the kinds of things that are going to happen that are going to make their lives better and safer and actually create jobs at the same time. There is so much that is um, yet to come that we can talk about as we move toward the election. And 
And in addition, we also want to be able to point out to not just the pundit naysayers, but all the naysayers who voted against the legislation. And, you know, there's going to be a, um, a, 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 an organized effort to make sure that there are billboards that say when the um, events happen to, uh, you know, uh, cut the ribbon, your congressman so-and-so voted no. So they know who voted yes and who is not with us. But I absolutely think that the um, idea that somehow this wasn't going to be a big issue, um, and I, uh, we can talk about that later, but I think particularly among young people, we are seeing that this is a motivating issue. This is an issue that can move elections and um, don't pay attention to the pundits. Thank you. Ebony Garland, would you like to, yeah. Yeah, I think if we look, we see 70% of Americans are alarmed and concerned about the climate crisis. And it's something that we're dealing with every day. So this will be at the top of the ballot. It is what motivates people to come out. And we have an obligation. I think it should be a part of the democratic strategy even more um, that we are electing climate champions at both the local and the state level. And we'll continue to show the pundits that they're wrong and that we are committed to taking action. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, just a little spin on that question. I wonder what role you saw climate and environmental justice play in your election and in Michigan in particular during the midterms. Sure. So Governor Gretchen Whitmer and I ran unapologetically on the fact that the state of Michigan has an important role to play in our climate future in America. We are home to 21% of the fresh water, not just in America, but in the entire world in the state of Michigan. I got a little bit of it. <laughs> Just saying. I got, I got, I got one great lake. We got five of them. Five. <laughs> <Whoa. Bye. laughs> so, so, so we do feel like we have a unique responsibility, a unique relationship, and a unique, you know, obligation, frankly, to be good stewards of these resources. And by first of all declaring that we understand that as leaders. That helps us speak to an anxiety that so many people in Michigan and America have. You said 70% of Americans. I mean, people are, are anxious about the future for basically two reasons. You're anxious for it because of climate change. You're anxious about it because of, like, what is the role that technology is going to play in affecting me and my family and the people that I'm connected to in the future? So I think it's imperative for elected officials who are trying to get reelected or candidates who want to get elected for the first time to be able to speak directly to one or both of those anxieties. And so we hope to do so in a really aggressive and full-throated way to say that, yes, we have solutions. Yes, there are things that we can do. Yes, there are tools that we have at our disposal to invest in the infrastructure in our communities that supports life, that supports safety, that supports public health, that allows people the right to have access to water that they can drink and air that they can breathe and an environment that they can enjoy and they can learn from. And that also makes sure that we can get the benefit of the amazing jobs that are created by investing in this infrastructure, the union jobs that are created, the, 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 the ability for people to build the types of uh, family supporting careers and realities that will lead to deeper investment in our communities in any number of, a number of ways. So we saw this show up in a huge way. The reason, one of the reasons that contributed to our record voter turnout amongst young people is because climate change was on the ballot alongside reproductive freedom in a full way in the state of Michigan. So I think it's important that we remember that this is something that we can win on. This is something we can win on because it's something that's connected to every single person's experience. And thank, I, thank I you. Yeah, no, go ahead. Add, um, Greenpeace is fiercely independent, but what we did do is focus on voter outreach, uh, basically comparing candidates and highlighting and contrasting around their records on environmental justice, their records with regards to uh, undue influence of big oil in their campaigns, and also their platforms. And what we saw was an uptick in unlikely voters who actually had concerns about the environment. And when we did post-race analysis after 2020 and 2022, we showed that voter turnout did turn up on uh, messages around climate. So it, it's really important, and we have to keep that at the forefront of our mind. Thank you. I, mean, I think we've all touched, everyone's touched at this point on this issue um, about 
does, you know, emphasizing environmental issues, which 70% of Americans in increasing numbers over time, it's escalating, say is important to them, but again, armchair pundits saying, well, maybe it's important, but people aren't actually voting based on it. And I'm hearing, you know, both turnout and voting decisions being based on that. Does anyone have any further thoughts uh, about which demographics are important? There's youth, but any s demographics within youth or other demographics where you think this is an important issue that actually affects voter turnout or voting decisions? Can I, can I build on something that yeah. Ebony shared about this, this being a difference maker in terms of turnout? I'll give a practical example in the state of Michigan that, that connects mobilizing federal resources that our Democrats in Congress helped to deliver uh, to a state like Michigan and then deploying them in a community that has been historically not just underserved, but like targeted for environmental injustice. So there's a, there's a small town in southwest Michigan called Benton Harbor. And Benton Harbor, Michigan was a town that, that we discovered via testing that they had significantly ele elevated levels of lead in the water in Benton Harbor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I went to Benton Harbor in October of 2021 and made a commitment that the state of Michigan, and can in part mobilize these federal resources, would make a, a generational investment to replace every lead service line in Benton Harbor in two, and do it in 24 months, in two years. Now, a, a town the size of Benton Harbor, that's a seven-year project. But we said we were going to do it in two years because it was that important. And I didn't think it made sense for people to drink lead-infested water for seven years. Well, because of coordination and understanding and collaboration, we were able to do that two-year project in 13 months. And what we saw, when you ask what communities are important, the communities that are most deeply impacted, this is a, this is a majority black city in southwest Michigan. It, has, it still is a city that's contending with some of the highest poverty rates in our state. But we chose to invest in the people and the infrastructure that supports these people, and we saw better turnout numbers in Benton Harbor. Now, I'm not saying that's a direct causation, but I'm saying it's related. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, that, I think that you show when you're showing up for people and investing in people and you care about their health, you care about their future, you are dealing with, the, with generational environmental injustices that have been done to people, we can make a difference, and I think people will recognize that as a political opportunity. Thank you. Congresswoman. Well, I just wanted to say that in Illinois, um, we have a couple of races where climate was a huge, <coughs> excuse me, a huge issue. Tough races. Sean Caston, who run, who who ran in a difficult race in, uh, in in Illinois, has made his life's work and his whole personal history around the issues and the expertise on 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 climate and continues that advocacy in in, in the house and won. Um, Eric Sorensen, who ran for the very first time in Northwest um, uh, Illinois um, in the Quad Cities, he was the weatherman in the uh, in the district for for years and years, and one of the few that actually did raise issues of climate. I wish we could get more, by the way, from the people who are on television and on the radio, you know, many many times a day to talk more about climate. Um, and uh, and Eric, who was a trusted voice because he was the the weatherman and raised these issues, won in. Um, Really, a uh, not necessarily expected to uh, to to win that race. Um, so we we're winning on these issues. But the other thing I want to say, every single day. So we had um, days last week, the highest temperatures ever throughout the world here in the United States of America. And you know that heat is the number one uh, cl climate killer of people. It's the number one hazard. You might some people might think in the middle of winter and people freezing, heat is the number one killer. And um, people are dying because of heat stroke. And we now know today that there's a warning of many parts of the state the United States of America about heat. And um, I was listening on, uh, on the radio that the temperatures in the water in Florida have reached 80 degrees. You know, this is also a killer of anything in those, in those waters. And finally, let me just say 
the experience that people are seeing in terms of the extreme weather events, in terms of the flooding, in terms of the forest fires. You know, you cannot ignore, as the, as the Republicans try to do, I mean, I don't know what communities they live in, and we need to make these connections. We can't just talk generically about climate. We have to bring it home to the communities. And um, environmental justice communities, uh, you know, you, you can speak more about that. But we can't, we have to talk about these are communities that are targeted for the most dangerous places to, uh, to, to live. So we have to bring it home to what are you experiencing in your family, in your community. That, that's, those are the environmental issues that we have to address. Thank you. Um, I think that is an absolutely crucial point, that we have to make message and get the news out there. Um, we're going to look ahead now to 2024, which is on many of our minds um, increasingly, and starting looking, uh, thinking about the federal level. Do we, I'm going to ask uh, you, do you think and I think I know the answer, but uh, I'd like your th to elaborate. Do you think climate will be on the ballot in 2024 at the federal level? And in what concrete ways might the Inflation Reduction Act impact that? Ebony, well, yeah. Well, I think I would also go back to your point about like which voting blocks um, are coming out in droves and numbers. And we can see right now the millennials and their siblings, which I just found out are called plurals, they will make up the majority of the electorate by 2028 and 60% of it by 2036. And we know that this block is extremely concerned about issues of the environment, issues of social justice, and they're not, um, they're not enticed by platitudes or performative action. They really want to see bold climate action. And when they don't see that, they call out folks. Like, this is a very vocal generation. So we will continue to see it on the ballot, and it is up to our officials to actually take these things seriously and not just uh, make promises, but actually keep these promises. And when this doesn't happen, then we do see gaps in enthusiasm and voter turnout. And we are seeing that with the approval of the Willow Project right now. We're seeing now yeah. that big blocks of the millennial generation are falling off and saying that they're not likely to vote for, for uh, President Biden. And we know the political calculus, we know what needs to happen, but we can't afford to ignore that. We can't afford. So we have to uh, continue to hold the administration and our government officials uh, accountable and push for this bold action. So um, it will continue to be on the ballot. I don't think we have a choice at this point. Um, yeah, and we have to win in 2024. We, we have all, to win. We all know like, what's at stake, yes. right? Yes, we have no, we no other option. We no really other don't. option. <laughs> um, Lieutenant Governor, we've seen over the last few years creation or passage of ambitious climate plans, as well as significant environmental justice and climate leadership by some state governments, including Michigan and definitely Illinois and Minnesota and many others. Um, will these be a factor in races for state legislators, legislatures and legislators where we have some important majorities to maintain and build on? Absolutely, so for context in Michigan, in the 2022 election, in addition to Governor Whitmer and I being reelected, Michigan won Democratic majorities in the State House and the State Senate to have a Democratic trifecta for the first time in 40 years. And, and so, so, so part of the, the question is like why and how? How, how did that come about? And there, there are a number of factors in it. I'd like to think that one of them was the fact that, you know, a, a little more than a year ago now, Governor Whitmer and I rolled out what we called our My Healthy Climate Plan, a plan to make have Michigan jump to uh, being a top five state in terms of how aggressive we are and not only meeting, you know, sort of carbon neutrality and net zero goals, but actually going far beyond to, to actually be a, a positive impact on, on the environment. And 
our state legislature, this Democratic majority, is going to deliver legislation to codify that plan in the fall. This is something that they will be able to run and win on in their communities. And the state budget we just passed that the governor will sign in a couple of weeks, they will, we have significant climate investment wins, whether it's water infrastructure, whether it's continuing to invest in the, the clean energy sector in Michigan. We're the number one state for clean energy sector job growth in the country. We are looking at expanding our, our portfolio when it comes to nuclear power generation in the state of Michigan by recommissioning a plant. So we are putting all the options on the table, and we're going to do it in a way that people can run and win on. And to, to tie back to something I said earlier, I talked about the city of Benton Harbor, Michigan. Well, we have a Democratic state representative representing Benton Harbor now for the first time in 36 years. And I was doing doors with him in Benton Harbor on the way down here to Chicago. And we talked about the win that he got for climate justice in this state budget. So there's a practical conversation to have with voters on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's going to be happening all across Michigan. I think it's going to help us expand not only our, our potential from an electoral standpoint, but it's also going to open up economic opportunity. The, the last thing I'll share is in Traverse City, Michigan, which is kind of a northwest part of the Lower Peninsula, we funded something called a Freshwater Innovation Center. This is something that will encourage people with ideas and research and energy and expertise about how to be to steward our freshwater, monitor it for threats and contaminants, but also to create innovation and in companies that can help uh, create value and jobs uh, in this space to have that be driven from the state of Michigan, the Great Lakes State. So we're super excited about all the opportunities, and this is something I think Democrats would be able to win on. Michigan, and I think it's a model for the country. Again, I'm from Michigan, so I'm, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I wonder if anyone has anything to add, want, they want to add to that? Um. I would just say we know we can't depend on Congress, so, but when we see progress at the state and local level, those are the areas where um, we have opportunity to advance an agenda. And when that happens at the state and local level, like it happened in Michigan and it happens in uh, Illinois, it paves the way for other states to take bold action. And it also motivates the electorate. So these are areas I think we have to continue to focus on. I don't, I, I keep saying it over and over, but it's where, it's really where the momentum occurs at the state and the local level. Thank you. Congresswoman, yeah. I just wanted to say a little bit more, a little bit more about younger younger voters and younger people. You know, I used to, many of us, um, you know, have said to kids under voting age, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? I never say that anymore. Now what I say, even to third graders or whatever, so what are you going to do to make the world a better place and a better place for, for you? We find kids, grammar school, high school, pre-eligible uh, to vote, very concerned about the air that they breathe, about the communities that, that they, they live in. And they can also use their voice, not just wait to the time or try and get people out to vote, but use their, their voice. And I like to encourage that. But, Young people, this is their century, not mine. I mean, I hope to live through it but uh, as much as I can. But you know what I'm saying. This is now the responsibility, and um, I think the impulse is for, for younger people to get involved. How, many of you may have heard about the Juliana versus um, the United States of America. It was a lawsuit, um, a constitutional lawsuit, that was uh, fired, f filed nearly eight years ago. The youngest was eight years old, and, um, and, and the oldest, I think, at the time was 19 years old. And they are still working on making sure that we do something about climate. And what they were saying is that it is their constitutional right, this was the basis of the lawsuit, to be able to have an environment that they can live in. And I agree with that. And I, right now I am pushing a, a resolution that would enshrine this idea of the Juliana, it's the Juliana resolution, that this should be a human right. 
and certainly a right in the United States of America under the, con under the Constitution. Um, so we need to mobilize families, we need to mobilize kids and everyone else who is living in communities that are victimized. In, in Illinois, we are the second largest state to have lead in our drinking water pipes right now. Um, I mean, these kinds of things that people might not associate as important in terms of environment. Look at the problems that Michigan has had in terms of water. In my district, which by and large, it's, it's pretty um, diverse, but there's um, pretty high income areas. There are small communities that are boiling their water as we speak right now because the private water company has not been doing what they, what they need to do. So I think it's connecting these home-based issues with environment that is so important, not to talk just generically about we have to have a clean planet, we have to be able to breathe the air, et cetera, et cetera, but this is what's going on in your neighborhood. One final thing I wanted to say in terms of elections too. There are now 18 districts that Joe Biden won that are now occupied by Republicans. And those Republicans in those districts who, by and large, have not moved an inch in order to address these issues, um, are now sitting there waiting for us to raise issues. They have voted against the Inflation Reduction Act and all other things to help the environment. They need to be held accountable. We can win this election if everyone gets out to vote. And that's the challenge right now, is about people feeling empowered enough and concerned enough about this issue and a variety of issues that they feel themselves the importance of getting out the, the vote, not waiting for activists and members of legislatures to, uh, to, to get out the vote. So, um, you know, this is a crisis right now, this minute, and we have to make sure everybody feels powerful enough to end it. Thank you. And and those Republicans who are out there in their districts taking credit for uh, the money from the Infrastructure Act and, and the Inflation Reduction Act and Chips and Science uh, that they voted against, uh, calling them out is absolutely important. And uh, we need to, I guess, uh, say, help the media along on this issue. Um, so thank you. And um, I, I also just want to amplify what Representative Schakowsky was saying about its youth and its, its millennials, as Ebony and, and uh, Lieutenant Governor were saying, but it's all ages. It's, we need a multi-generational effort. And I'm wondering, um, just quickly, Ebony, if, if, have you seen more of like elders getting, elders tend to vote. Yes. Um, but are they, is there more activism? Have you seen a, a surge in that? People caring about their kids and their grandkids and, yeah. I think we see it, um, Bill McKibben has a whole generation of, I think, the rocking chair activists oh, that, that go out and say, no, we want a climate that is sustainable, a planet that is sustainable for our children, for our grandchildren, and for future generations. And you see them out in front of the banks, calling on the banks to divest in fossil fuel mon money. Um, and it is a multi-generational, so you see the youth uh, out marching, and then you see my age, I'm a part of the millennials, and then you see um, the rocking chair activists. So it, it is a multi-generational fight, and it will take all of us united, not just in an environmental movement, but across the progressive agenda for us to make the change that we need to make. Let me, uh, let me just add to that, as someone who is a longtime advocate that focuses a lot on older Americans, um, health care issues um, are also affected That's because true. of climate. Yes. I mean, you, when, when you saw the bad air, and I think some of it's coming this way, maybe even later today, um, you know, 
especially older people, should not go outside, should not exert themselves too, too much. A lot of problems with respiratory issues that, uh, that older people feel. So climate and the negative impacts of, uh, you know, uh, the, the bad cli the, the, the climate issues absolutely affects older Americans. And as much as they, we want them to be concerned about their children and grandchildren, their health is at stake as well. Thank you. Um, I want to remind anyone who came in later, uh, there are index cards in the front rows and pens. So if you have a question for our speakers, please write it down. And then Russ is going to stand up and you drop it off in that bag. Um, and so that we can uh, ask the maximum number of questions possible in a concise way. This will help us with that. And if you're in the back, come forward and get yourself an index card and, and stay up here with us. Um, it is, in fact, cooler up here for some reason. So, uh, uh, and uh, I want to thank all of you, and also thank our uh, online live stream viewers for being with us. With Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky of Illinois, and Executive Director of Greenpeace USA, Ebony Twilly Martin. Um, so this next question I'm going to direct first to the, to the LG, um, my LG. Um, so, sometimes I hear, um, a, something I hear a great deal about as I travel the country talking with Democrats about climate is that tailored targeting message about environmental justice and climate is really important. And so the question is, do you think Democratic candidates and elected leaders need to frame their outreach and messaging better, differently? Does that outreach and messaging need to differ based on their community, district, state? So I think there's always an opportunity for us to strengthen messaging. And what, in my experience, the more direct you can be in conversation with a person that speaks to something that they are experiencing in real time, the, the more likely you are to demonstrate to them that like you understand and, and, and you care and that you actually do prioritize this issue for them. So uh, I talked about Michigan, we're a very large state, 83 counties, two peninsulas, and it's important for me when I show up anywhere in Michigan to be able to understand what are the specific environmental concerns for that community and then to speak to them. So I do think it's worth us doing the work. And there are so many organizations that have been doing the research to understand the different types of things that resonate in different communities. And it's also imperative that we as public servants go and hold space with people so we can hear directly from them about what environmental concerns matter to them. So for me, what that looked like is in, in 2019 and in 2021, I did, I did a tour called Thriving Cities in Michigan, where this was all about how do we improve quality of life for people who live in cities. And so in 2019, I went to 21 cities. In 2021, I went to 24. And we had conversations about what it meant to improve quality of life in really five areas, affordable housing, creating economic opportunity, uh, experiences for children in cities, transportation, transit, and mobility. And the final one was environmental quality and justice. And so asking people to rank which of those five uh, was most urgent for them and then which was most important, what we saw was that this question of environmental justice and the experience of environmental justice cut across all those other issues. And so I, I guess my, how, how I would answer your question a little more, a little more succinctly is, it is important to do the work to understand why environmental concerns, why questions of environmental justice matter to a particular community, and it's worth the time to, to do that research and gain it. Or to, and if you don't know, to go and create space for people to tell you. Thank you. Any follow-up? I just want to say one thing about optimism. And if you look around right now on the private sector, we're seeing more innovation and technology development and moving ahead that in, um, in, in terms of clean, the, a clean economy than we're seeing at all in the fossil fuel economy. Now, the Republicans are constantly defending, um, you know, the 
uh, you know, people who give them money. Um, that's the, the fossil fuel industry. But we have every reason to be, because of the uh, Legis the the uh, president that we have and our work at the legislature and at the private sector to the development of technology. So we are on our way. And so what we need is people to believe that we can do this and that we can move this agenda forward. And if we don't have the right people in power, then we're going to really be stuck. So this is, this is a, a good time, really. There's a lot to look forward to. Thank you. I think also um, in the environmental space, we kind of get caught up in the jargon and using really technical words that miss people. And uh, to, to listen to Garland's point, we have to find ways to meet people with where they are. Yeah. Yeah. If in your district uh, you need jobs and you're talking about the investments from the IRA that will invest in training for uh, clean renewable energy, well, training to um, uh, implement clean and renewable energy, that's something that might resonate with um, one district. If you're in a district where everyone is having asthma and talking about the health care um, and what those investments can bring. So it, it really is important that we become more targeted in our messaging and that our messaging meets people where they are and kind of getting away from, I think, the science talk, but actually the human in the heart approach. Um, that works everywhere. Work. Yeah. In, including in rural areas and in agriculture areas. There are plenty of environmental issues that we can address there, too. Definitely. Absolutely. Um, so continuing uh, to focus on, you know, uh, messaging, um, I'm going to focus a little bit on Congress. Uh, we, as we've noted, passing meaningful climate legislation going forward in Congress is going to be in this Congress is going to be very difficult. We're gonna change that next cycle. Yes. We're gonna get those majorities, those strong majorities. But um, given the situation, um, Congresswoman, what can Democrats in Congress do to call out the obstruction and disinformation from national Republicans on this issue so we have that clear contrast that we need in 2024 for campaigning on? And I guess I'd also add, and what can we in this room do to support uh, Democrats in Congress on this. You're right that the, it is unlikely that we're going to be able to pass anything really positive. Um, I am on the environmental subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and we just had a hearing this week and heard one of my colleagues talking about it costs 70 percent more to make an electric car than to make a, a, a regular car with the regular with uh, with the current engines i mean come on um and he says this is not opinion this is absolutely fact um and so there's all kinds of misinformation that she, that keeps uh, going out about um the efficacy of having real in, um environmental uh improvements in our technology um so we fight back. We have a uh, very robust discussion uh, on, on these things. But ultimately, we are not going to pass legislation right now under this uh, majority that's in the slim majority that's in the um, House of Representatives. So we have to win, and then we can move quickly. That's the other thing I want to say about victory. Hmm. We have to move quickly, right away, on these kinds of important questions when we take power. We can't, um, you know, diddle around for a while, but we have an opportunity in this, particularly in this environmental crisis, that we're going to have to move right away to um, make sure that we're um, on the right track as quickly as possible. Yeah, absolutely, and that's part of why I especially appreciate the resolution that you introduced yesterday in Congress about the fundamental rights of children to a healthy future. If we start teeing this up, queuing it up, and getting the conversation going, the legislation ready um, to, to pass once, once we take back a strong power in a strong way. Um, we keep introducing bills. There are, there are many, many really good bills that can become law 
when we have the majority. So we're not waiting, thinking about what can we do when we win. We're ready to go. Um, so the climate crisis, as we've all said, and as you all know, is here and now, and we are seeing and experiencing it. Yeah, it's literally in the air that we breathe. Um, and so this is sort of a variation on what I just asked the Congresswoman, but I'll address it to Director Truly Martin and Lieutenant Governor uh, Gilchrist. How can Democrats be more aggressive or assertive in framing this issue and enabling candidates to run on this issue and making clear to voters the real and growing threat from climate change? And we've, we've talked about it a little bit. Do you have any further thoughts? Let's see, how can they be aggressive? I think there are a number of ways. Um, first, building platforms that address the issues that people are concerned about and that they hear within their constituent groups and among their communities. I think um, taking bold action, as Representative Chikasi said, we have all of the innovation. It's already out there. We have the solutions. Now we need folks that are going to be uh, bold and courageous and actually do what science and justice demand in this moment. And voters are looking for that. That is what voters are holding us accountable to. So I think all of the pieces are there. I think right now it's just the courage. Um, we know what the pundits are saying. We know uh, what the, f the oil and gas industry has. We know the money behind them. We know how they spread disinformation. We know how they infuse their money into politics and uh, convince politicians to do what's not in the best interest of their constituents. And it's really time for us to start to expose that, really expose where the dark money lives and how it's influencing our politics. There are many different ways which they can uh, take bold action. And I think it's just like really now having the courage to do it. I 100% I agree with that, that, uh, you know, courage is key. And the other piece is we have to show up That's everywhere. Members of Congress, people who are running for office, have to go out and talk to everyone. And I mean we have to talk in districts that are currently Republican or independent or really aren't thinking about these issues. We need to show up. And our message is powerful. And if we shape it right and we shape it local, like you said, be where people are, that's how we have to talk. We can win these elections. But I think we have um, isolated ourselves from too many communities that are suffering right now and don't know that we are here to work with them to change that. I agree that this is a tremendous opportunity. And I think maybe one way that will provide more candidates with more opportunities to talk about the importance of these climate change issues is to really draw clear pictures and clear connections to how this relates to literally every other issue. And, 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 and Director, you, you made that point before about just like, you know, on, on job creation, the reason we need to do community and economic development in an inclusive way is because we need to grow our communities in ways that are more environmentally responsible we can do so in a way that encourages the kind of housing that enables us to be better stewards of the land that we, that we occupy. We can also do so in a way that encourages the technological investment that is coming down as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, that's leading to new industries being created in North America, which means new high paying, high quality jobs. The state of Michigan landed the first ever electrolyzer plant in North America from Nell Hydrogen from the from the Netherlands just a couple of months ago. That is an entirely new industry that will be now present in America because of this federal investment aligning with, with, with us at the state level and locals being able to deploy this new technology in a way that will benefit and transform our energy economy and doing so in a way that creates jobs and justice. And so the opportunity is if you care about making sure that people have communities that can thrive and they can live in that are healthy, then you need to make sure you're, 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 you're in the right place on climate. If you care about making sure 
that we have clean air and clean water. You care about environmental quality and justice. If you care about the way people get from point A to point B and doing so in a way that does not contribute so deeply to climate change and the warming of the planet, that's you should support those types of legislators that will make the kinds of investments we've made in Michigan to expand access to public transportation. The work that we've done to the, one of the largest contributors to climate change are the emissions from our vehicles, and that's why we have fought so hard in the state of Michigan to land four new electric vehicle battery plants to scale up electric vehicle manufacturing itself and land more parts of the supply and value chain for electric vehicles in the state of Michigan to train people to take those new jobs in the same sector that they may have now that may look different tomorrow, but we have a pathway for them to get the education and skills to walk that path and not get left behind. This connects to all of the conversations that we have in communities that have been sources of anxiety that can become sources of opportunity, optimism, and inspiration. And I think candidates who can talk like that are the kinds of candidates who are going to win everywhere in, in Michigan and around the country. You're here. Yeah. I could say one more thing because I think, is my husband still here? He's been working very hard on the... Um, issue of high-speed rail. Transportation is the number one issue of uh, climate right now, of, of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, environmental problems. If we had a really efficient high-speed rail that people could could take it would help. It would help, for example, small towns, where if you got on the uh, the train in the Quad Cities within an hour, you could come to a job in Chicago, if we had high speed rail, and especially if it were done like they're doing in California, where it is all going to be clean energy for high speed rail. But we have to think about our transportation system too. Not only having electric cars, uh, which I'm the proud owner of a Chevy Bolt, which is very affordable by the way. Anyway, um, and, um, but, but we also had really good um, high speed rail and really efficient transportation in this country, mass transit in this country where a lot of places don't have any mass transit. Um, then I think we would, um, that that's a direction that we ought to go in as well. So, Bob, if you're still here, I'm doing your thing about high-speed rail. And you're right. <laughs> you're absolutely right. <laughs> um, uh, well, thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for the shout out for your husband who does such incredible work for which we're grateful, as well as grateful to everyone in this room who I know is working so hard on these issues. Um, kind of uh, summing up before we move to uh, questions from the audience and just a reminder the way we're doing audience questions so that we get more questions in in a concise way is we're writing them on index cards which are available on seats up in the front rows and then Russ stand we've got stand up and we've got the, he's coming around and collecting them we're going to start that very soon so if you have a question write it down and, and uh, get it to us um, and once again, if we don't get to your question here, um, we will be answering uh, the rest of the questions on social media. So we want to make sure everyone's voices are heard and it, that it is inclusive. Um, so just a quick round robin, and I'm really not in a lot of suspense about the answer to this question, but I'm asking everyone to take a minute to say first, yes or no, will climate be on the ballot in 2024 and beyond? and their top one or two reasons why that would be so. Uh, who would like to start? Yes. <laughs> All right, yes. Captain, yes. Yes? Captain, yes. Lieutenant Governor. The answer is absolutely yes. Yeah, no question. And, and I think the reasons why are because, again, I think that this speaks to an anxiety that everyone has, even if they can articulate it. Anxiety about the future is anxiety about climate and anxiety about technology. And we have a chance to solve both those problems by being right on here on policy. The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we have 100 year floods now occurring every five years. We have uh, record breaking heat waves. We have um, wildfires that are causing air pollution. We have rising cancer rates. Um, it's a concern. It's what we're dealing with. It's not, the climate crisis is not coming, it's here. And uh, as long, when we don't take action, it exacerbates and the impacts increase. So we, we don't have a choice. 
it, it has to be an uh, issue that we continue to address and address with urgency. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, we are going to now move to questions from the audience. And uh, Russ Khan and Lake Liao, I just want to say thank you to them because they've been staffing this event and they serve, they're volunteers serving on the DNC Climate Council's advisory team um, and our environmental organization, organizers in their states of Lake is in Michigan and uh, Russ is in Florida, states that certainly are on the front lines of the climate crisis, just like the entire country. Um, so they're going to be reading questions uh, and they've got a mic, right? Testing. Yep. So would you stand up and, and uh, yeah, read them and then we'll uh, ask our panelists to answer. Um, all right, so first question is, uh, how would you recommend the climate movement and like elected officials who are good on climate join forces with other crucial movements and issues to collectively mobilize voters on issues that they care about? I think in spaces like this, this is where we can come together, we can conspire, we can hear uh, where our goals overlap and intersect, and we can figure out how we uh, build strategies that are um, inclusive, not just, not just addressing certain or small areas, but how we can be more expansive. Um, I, I think that is also one thing that the environmental uh, movement needs to push on, being more cross-movement oriented and showing up in spaces where we haven't traditionally showed up. But all of the issues are interconnected. At the end of the day, um, nothing else will advance if we don't save our planet. Uh, one of my um, program director often says, there are no jobs on a dead planet. Those things overlap. So us constantly finding ways that we can come together, find like goals, and then build solutions towards those goals, and then motivating our bases to come out in service of those goals, because our democracy is the best tool that we have to ensure a healthy life, a healthy planet, and a healthy environment. All right, uh, no, okay. Um, yeah, go ahead, Russ. All right, our next question. Um, environmental justice communities are often responsible to do their own health monitoring, monitoring surveys and research. Many communities do not even know that they're exposed to toxicity in their areas. How can this be addressed by elected officials and candidates running for office? So that's a big opportunity. I, I agree that you shouldn't, that should not be those residents' responsibility. And so one of the, opportunities has been created thanks to the significant federal investment that's happened over the last two years from this Congress and from or the previous Congress, to be clear, and from the uh, Biden-Harris administration has been more resources deployed to states to be able to do this kind of equipping and the kind of monitoring. In in Michigan, we, we organized a whole new department of state government um, called the Environment uh, the, Office, the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, or EGLE, and it has increased the, the, the rate at which we are doing this kind of testing and monitoring in communities across Michigan. That is how we discovered the lead in the service lines in Benton Harbor, Michigan, that I referred to earlier by that increased frequency and increased um, how, how, increased how robust that testing apparatus is. And so I do think it's our responsibility, and, and then it is our charge once we find a problem that we do have to step up and solve it. And so uh, continuing to work closely with the federal government to make sure we have the resource to do so um, is a priority for us. And we're really proud of the Michigan delegation has been uh, really on that, uh, you know, with a lot of aggression. So whether it's in lead contamination, um, PFAS contamination for forever chemicals that are showing up in water in multiple places like Michigan, we really have been aggressive on calling for a federal standard for that, which, don't, which none does not exist today. Um, but then doing so and leading the, leading the way on mitigation efforts, and that is important as well just say um, data collection is very important I'm not not just collecting but doing more research um, I, 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 I guess we don't do enough of that Tar looking at certain communities and analyzing you know where is asthma a bigger problem maybe we do it in some context but I think being more um, deliberate about looking at the um, advances among communities 
of um, climate situations, I think it's really important. I don't know if we do enough data. Well, to put a finer point on it, this also is an opportunity. So I've talked a lot about the connection between responding to the climate crisis and, and sort of the economic opportunity and entrepreneurial opportunity associated with that. And I'm a recovering entrepreneur, so that's why I think about it in that way. But, but there are folks who are looking at the deployment of technology that, again, is not looking at people, but is like looking at the environment for the impacts that it may have on people. And we've seen a tremendous amount of startup activity in this realm, using modern devices, using modern intelligence and machine learning to understand, again, how to anticipate where the most dangerous spots may be and also to understand and do the backstory based on this type of analysis of how we got to this point and how the problem got so deep in certain communities. Because understanding those two pieces can then help us identify how to respond to it appropriately. So there's an opportunity for, again, innovation and growth in the economy in this as well. Thank you. I, um, I think it's uh, both heartening and dispiriting that the environmental, the climate models, that had been worked on and developed over the last decades are now being proven to be absolutely true in the things that they predict were going to happen. Uh, things affecting the upper atmosphere and tipping points and things like that. So it's heartening because that we know a lot, um, although we definitely need more research on a wide range of environmental issues, uh, but also of course dispiriting because uh, what they're showing in terms of the trends are, are um, Sobering. So, um, we have another next question. Um, all right. So, in a state like Michigan and others with strong home rule systems, how can we best develop and reinforce county and municipal climate action plans and programs? So, this is about enabling communities to set standards for environmental protection. And ultimately, we want people to have the most tools that they can have at their disposal. We've dealt with the opposite problem, frankly, in Michigan for generations. We had, so one of the most important, it was kind of a technical thing, one of the most important things that our legislature, this Democrat legislature has been looking at uh, just this year is we had Republicans put in place these laws that said that no community in Michigan could have a standard that was stronger than a federal standard. And so they've looked at how can, so they're looking at how do we roll that back such that communities can frankly take back their environment. And, and so, so I think there's an opportunity for folks to organize around that and to support that um, in, in states that may have similar regimes. I don't know if that's true for how many places that that's true, but it's an opportunity to say that we can change the apparatus of, uh, of state government, for example, to not be a hindrance, but instead to be a tool for creating this kind of opportunity for folks to, to, to lead. And then that can open the door for, for other kinds of innovation that can make good things happen. State legislatures now are so important, more than ever, I think, now, because especially in this environment. Um, and so think about those elections as well. It's so critical that we uh, have more, um, that, w that we pay attention and have more Democrats in, in these states and make sure that we get the best environmental and other issues as possible. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. With all with all the doom and gloom around uh, 1.5 uh, climate change heating, um, is it too late to stop the climate crisis? And should we spend should we be spending more on climate mitigation? Uh, thorny, tough questions from this audience, and good ones. <laughs> it's never too late. <laughs> it's never too late. Um, we have to have hope. Hope is having only positive expectations. Hope is what carried our ancestors and it's what has to carry us as well. Um, and hope also is it's a bit different than optimism. So you have to wake up and intentionally choose to hope and then put action behind your hope. And you find when you take action against the climate crisis, it lowers your anxiety. So we have to... Um, we have to wake up with a spirit of optimism, no, of hope and encouragement. And while we do have to work to mitigate certain things and we do have the technology in place to do the mitigation, we also have to actively work at um, 
stopping and ending the things that we do that fuel the crisis. And right now, that's really fossil fuel and gas um, uh, extraction. Absolutely. That's, that's what science and de uh, demands at the moment now, and that's what we have to do, and we just have to fight for it. We have to fight. We have to fight. There was a climate expert on uh, NPR yesterday. I don't know his name. Bob, do you remember who that was? Um, that was absolutely optimistic um, about our opportunity um, to save the, uh, save the environment. Um, the op and when you say accommodation, um, there may be things that we want to do um, to help people that, you know, in, in the meantime, but we can't abandon the idea that we're just going to let the uh, climate crisis get worse and worse, hotter and hotter. Um, that is not an option. It's just not an option. For years, many of us have been saying uh, lack of action is not, uh, not an option, but now we're at this moment, we're absolutely have to keep fighting for the environment and for the, uh, you know, the next generations. But we can do that. And he was very optimistic about the things that could absolutely improve um, over the the next years. So, um, and he 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 was the guy a guy that really knew all the science here. I guess uh, what I guess we're on closing. You know, what is humanity if not having agency, right? It, and, and we cannot see that. Mm -hmm. The truth is, we got to do both. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, we have to be aggressive when it comes to mitigation, and we have to be aggressive with cutting off the sources of climate change. And so I, I, I wholeheartedly reject the notion that we need to give up on any of these priorities. And, and, and so we all have a role to play in it, and we all must be as creative as we can to play that role so that we can make progress. I, I always believe that it's possible. Um, because it, again, if, if we don't hold that principle, then literally why are we here? That, that's, why, that's why we do what we do. Let me amplify that too. You know, so yes, you're absolutely right. We have to do mitigation. If you call, for example, cooling centers that we have for people, that's a kind of mitigation, right? We make it possible for people to go someplace that's, that's cool. Does that mean that we're not going to fight to, you know, stop the the the, the what's heating the the world? And by the way, um, you know, it's one thing in the United States of America where there is the presence of air conditioning in many places, many places around the world that are now experiencing, you know, 110, 112 degrees, there is no place to go. And it also, of course, affects agriculture then as well. We already have uh, migrants who have to leave because they can't grow crops an anymore. So we have, to, we have to keep fighting, even as we try and help people that are suffering from the worst of it. Um, so, uh, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, Congresswoman Schakowsky, and Director Martin, uh, thank you so much for your time today. This was a wonderful and important conversation. Would you all join me in giving them a big hand? As everyone here has said, Democrats must run on climate and environmental justice, and we can and will run on the environment, and win, but they can't do it alone. Candidates and electeds need all of us and all of you. And I too sometimes get up in the morning and read the headlines, and it's tough, you know? So we need to take care of ourselves, we need to take care of each other, and we need to keep going in this fight while doing that self-care and that care for our communities. Um, so please, sign up on our clipboards that have been going around if you haven't to get the follow-up to this meeting. Join us at the councils. We work every way, day to make this panel's focus a reality that we win we run and we win on climate um, and make sure we have that leadership at the federal, state and local levels to address the climate environmental justice crises and all of the intersectional crises that we've talked about, housing and transportation and healthcare, because climate affects everything and everything affects climate. Um, and also, 
back the efforts of Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, of the Congresswoman, and of Greenpeace USA, all doing such crucial work. Please follow them on social media and keep amplifying their work. Um, so, I have to say something. I want to yeah. thank you oh. and thank the DNC yeah. because of that, absolutely. You know, what are Democrats doing? Look at Michelle, look at what we are doing, what we're focusing on as a party to make sure that this is the issue and that we know how to work it um, in the in the next election. So, you know, we're, we're I'm I'm grateful to be on a, a panel like this, but I really am happy that you and the DNC are fully engaged. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um. And thank you to all of you in this room. You all rock. I'm so grateful. And you, the panelists, you're the inspiration. That's, you're what gets me past those headlines and to get sitting down and or standing up and marching and getting to work every day. Um, being here at Netroots in this room with you is just amazing. Um, thank you and onward. <laughs>